other bishops, fathers, friends. On this feast day of St. Nicholas, I am happy to greet you and to be with you. The title that I have chosen for my address this evening is The Holy Icon, Doorway into the Kingdom of Heaven. I have a particular reason for including the word doorway in my title. The series of lectures of which my address forms part and the notable exhibition of icons with which this series of lectures is linked are taking place at the beginning of the year of faith celebrated by Catholics throughout the world. Announcing this year of faith, His Holiness Pope Benedict entitled his apostolic letter Porta Fidei, the doorway of the faith. Now the holy icon is exactly a doorway of the faith. And though the Pope, in using that phrase, was not thinking directly of the icon, yet his words apply precisely to my theme tonight, as we shall see in a moment. How central, how fundamental are the holy icons in the spiritual life of the Christian East, both Catholic and Orthodox. How impoverished our religious experience would be without the icons. If we did not have icons, how much warmth, how much joy would be lacking in our prayer and worship. In the Christian East, whether Orthodox or Catholic, there is no act of prayer, either at church or in the home, that is not accompanied by the holy icons. They are with us everywhere. This evening, indeed, I've brought with me a small icon that I always have when I'm writing or when I'm giving talks at conferences. This is an icon that shows our Lord Jesus Christ as an angel and it is known as the icon of blessed silence. Blagoi Molchanie. So I keep this icon before me because theologians and bishops have a tendency to talk too much. <laughs> it's a warning to me as I write and speak. Saint Ignatius of Antioch even says that we should respect the bishop much more when he keeps silent than when he speaks. <laughs> I was taught a threefold rule when giving addresses. Stand up, speak up, and shut up. <laughs> the first two are easier to do than the third. Let's start tonight by asking the elementary question, what is an icon? The Greek word, ikon, you will tell me, means likeness, reflection, or image. When you look in the mirror and you see your own face, what you are looking at is an icon of yourself. When Narcissus saw his face reflected in a pool of water and fell in love with what he saw, 
He was looking at his own icon. So, in itself, the word icon can have a very broad application. If then we are speaking of the icon in a religious context, we need to qualify the word by saying not just icon, but holy icon. What in that case is a holy icon? What special image or reflection do we find embodied in the holy icons? An excellent definition is given to us in a text from the 8th century, the life of St. Stephen the New, who died as a martyr in defense of the holy icons during the iconoclast controversy. In this work, the icon is described as a doorway, thera. What does that mean? A doorway, a means of entry. But an entry or means of access into what? Extending the metaphor, we may say that the holy icon is a point of meeting, a place of encounter. But encounter with what or whom? In answer, it may be said that the icon is a doorway into the kingdom of heaven. It is a means of access into the age to come. It is a point of meeting and encounter with the communion of saints. In this way, the icon as a doorway fulfills a mediating function. <laughs> the icon makes persons and events present to us. Through the icon, we meet the person that is shown to us, whether it is Christ the Savior, the Mother of God, one of the angels, or one of the saints. For example, St. Nicholas, who is watching over me here. If it is an icon of a particular event, the Nativity, the Transfiguration, the Resurrection, then we may say that through the icon we participate in the mystery that is depicted. Participation, that's a key word in the theology of the icon. Thus the theology of the icon is par excellence a theology of presence. Often the icon is described as a window, and that is certainly appropriate. But we go further when we call the icon, as I have done tonight, a door. A window is something through which we look, gazing upon the landscape from a distance. But a door is something through which we pass so that we ourselves become part of the landscape. Moreover, doors are two-way, so that the icon is not only a door through which we pass into the heavenly kingdom, but a door through which the dwellers in the heavenly kingdom pass to meet us face to face. That's why I've described the icon as a point of meeting, a place of encounter. The icon makes persons and events present to us immediately and personally. The icon initiates us into the kingdom of heaven. Now, when you enter an Eastern Christian place of worship, Orthodox or Catholic, the first thing that will strike you is the iconostasis, the icon screen, 
dividing the sanctuary from the nave. Sometimes people complain about the iconostasis and they say that it hides things from them. In answer to that, the Russian priest theologian Father Pavel Florensky rightly insisted that the iconostasis hides nothing from us. On the contrary, it reveals supernatural realities to us and makes them immediately accessible. St. Simeon of Thessalonica, writing in the early 15th century, speaks of the icon screen as marking the frontier between earth and heaven. The icon screen, that is to say, makes the kingdom of heaven present to us here on earth. Through the icon screen, the persons depicted upon it, for example, the person of Christ, the high priest, the person of the Holy Mother of God with her child, and along with them, saints and angels, the members of the heavenly realm are all present to us. The icon screen does not hide, it reveals. The icon screen does not act as a division, but as a bridge. A point of meeting, an encounter with the Saviour and the saints. This means that when we look at an icon, we are being challenged and judged. We may think that we can judge the icons. We may go upstairs to the gallery and say, yes, I like that icon, and no, I don't like that one. But, in fact, it's not we who are judging the icon. When you look at an icon, the icon is judging you. Now, let's look at some of the consequences of this definition of the icon as a doorway, a means of entry, a point of meeting. There are three consequences in particular that I would like to mention. When I was uh, ordained priest, I remember asking the bishop who ordained me for advice about my future ministry. And he said, always have three points in your sermon not less and not more. <coughs> so I like to have three points in my lectures. When I was consecrated bishop, I asked the chief consecrator for his advice about my Episcopal ministry. And he said, always fold up your own vestments at the end of the service. <laughs> Don't let the deacons do it. <laughs> Well, I try to follow both those pieces of advice. Actually, I think it's too much often to have three points in a sermon. One point is quite sufficient. And a great many sermons we hear seem to have no point at all. <laughs> so, uh, three points in honor of the Holy Trinity. And here let me tell you a little story about the Trinity. Once upon a time, there was a bishop going to the, by boat to the monastery, the Solovetsky Monastery in the far north of Russia. And as they traveled, they passed various islands. And the captain of the ship said to him, pointing to a nearby island, that's a very interesting place. There are three hermits on the island. And the bishop said, let's turn aside and visit them. So they did. As they approached the island, the three hermits 
who definitely had a premonition that a bishop was coming to visit them, were standing side by side holding hands on the beach with their long white beards. And the bishop questioned them, how do you pray, holy men? And the hermit said, this is how we pray. Three are ye, three are we. Have mercy on us. Ah, oh, said the bishop, that's not actually the correct way to pray. Uh, do you use the Lord's Prayer? No, holy bishop, they said. We've never heard of that. So he spent the whole afternoon teaching them the Lord's Prayer, getting them to learn it by heart, and they kept forget it, forgetting it, but he kept repeating it. And at last they said, yes, now we remember the Lord's Prayer. And so the bishop returned to his boat, continued on his journey, feeling he'd done a good afternoon's work. But the experience of meeting the three hermits was so strange. These three holy men standing hand in hand with their long white beards on the shore, that the bishop couldn't settle down to go to his cabin and to sleep. He sat long after sunset on the deck. And then suddenly, in the far distance, he saw a light moving rapidly across the water towards the boat. And as it came closer, he saw it was the three hermits skimming over the waves, bright with light, their long beards flowing in the wind and gleaming. The bishop, in great astonishment, stood at the rail of the boat, and as the three hermits approached, they called out to him, Holy Bishop! We have forgotten the prayer you taught us. Teach us again. <laughs> and the bishop said, Holy men, you pray to God in your own way. I have nothing to teach you. Go in peace. And so the three hermits turned back, skimmed across the water and disappeared. Though long after they'd gone over the horizon, a light could be seen in the night. So, three are ye, three are we. The Trinity is the heart of our life, and that's why I like to choose three points in my talks. First, the icon exists in a context a context of prayer and worship. And if you take an icon out of that context, it ceases to be truly a holy icon and it no longer acts as a door. Now, many people buy icons and hang them up on their walls, treating them simply as works of art. I'm glad they do this. And I'm confident that in many cases the icons hanging on their walls have a positive effect on them. But the icon, though it is a work of art, is not a work of art on a level with other works of art. An icon is not simply an aesthetic object that you may admire doting the color, the style, the expression on the faces, analyzing the period and the particular school to which the icon belongs in art history. If the icon is treated in this way, merely on the art historical level, we have missed the real point about it. In contrast to other works of art, the icon is essentially part of an act of prayer and worship. It is not simply a piece of decoration designed to make the church look nice. It is much more than that. The art of the icon 
is supremely a liturgical art. That is the first consequence of regarding the icon as a doorway into the heavenly kingdom. Some years ago in England, the Sunday Times ran a feature article interviewing different people who owned icons. Most of them were clearly unbelievers, though it was also evident that their icons meant a great deal to them. In a somewhat inarticulate manner, they said things such as, there's something different about an icon, something mysterious, something strange. I don't like to sit smoking cigarettes in front of the icon. The icon changes the atmosphere in my room. Now the last person who was interviewed, Count Alexei Bobrinskoy, an expert at the auction house Christie's, was the only one who was an Orthodox Christian. And he was the only one who came to the real point. When asked what icons meant to him, he replied firmly, I pray in front of my icons. There he precisely indicated what makes the icon different, what makes it mysterious, what gives it power. The icon is part of an act of prayer, part of the liturgy, and if divorced from the liturgy, it loses its true identity. There is a second point, arising directly from the first. Prayer and theology are inseparable. Liturgy and dogma cannot be divided. In the words of one of the Desert Fathers of the fourth century, Evagrius of Pontus, the theologian is the one who prays. And if you pray in truth, you are a theologian. So the icon, the art of the icon as a liturgical art, is also a theological art. The icon is theology in line and color. There is an essential link between the icon and the gospel. The gospel is the word proclaimed. The icon is the word depicted. The two are correlative and complementary. The gospel is an icon in words, and the icon is the gospel in pictures. So the Seventh Ecumenical Council, the Second Council of Nicaea held in 787, when defining the place of the icon in the Christian church, insisted that it is to be venerated in the same way as the Book of the Gospels and also the cross. The link between icon and gospel is greatly emphasized by St. John of Damascus. His three homilies on the holy icons are still the best patristic work for anyone who, to read who wishes to enter deeply into the meaning of the holy icon. And I note that there's a copy of that book exactly on the table over there. Also, another book on icons I would particularly recommend, and I think that's for sale over there as well, is the book of Leonid Uspensky and Vladimir Olosky, The Meaning of Icons. So, there are copies there for you to buy at the end, and I don't get a commission. <laughs> the icon is rightly to be seen as a proclamation of the faith as part of holy tradition. In the painting of icons, human creativity is by no means excluded. Different iconographers paint each in their own distinctive style. But the icon does not depend simply on the invention of, of 
the iconographer or his private imagination. For it is an expression of the saving truth upheld in holy tradition. For this reason it is particularly appropriate that you here in Villanova University have chosen to mark the year of faith by organizing an exhibition of icons. And I congratulate Father Richard Canuli and Archpriest John Perich with their helpers for the initiative that they've taken. <clears throat> so the icon then as a theological art has an integral place in any year of faith. Then there is a third consequence of the approach to the holy icons that I am outlining. The art of the icon is not only a liturgical art and not only a theological art, it is also a sacramental art. As I've already commented, the icon performs a mediating function. It renders present. Just as the Holy Sacrament of the Eucharist renders Christ truly present to us in the gifts of bread and wine that have been consecrated and have become his body and blood, so on another level the icons render Christ truly present to us. They perform a sacramental function. Obviously, in the case of the icons, the presence of Christ is on a significantly different level from his presence to us in the Holy Eucharist. The icons, even when blessed, remain wood and paint. Whereas the bread and wine, once consecrated, are not merely an icon of the body and blood of Christ, but after consecration they become nothing less than his true and actual body and blood. Nevertheless, there is an authentically real presence of Christ in his icon. As the Seventh Ecumenical Council insisted, divine grace is present in the icon and is communicated to those who offer veneration to it. Let me now, in this next part of my talk, submit to you three quotations three again, that may serve as a guide to illuminate our path. One quotation is from scripture, one from the liturgy, and one from a novelist. My scriptural quotation is from the prologue of St. John's Gospel, John 1.14, the word became flesh and lived among us and we have seen his glory. Here in these words of St. John, we have the foundation and justification of all Christian iconography. And this is a master theme in St. John of Damascus. In the Old Testament, St. John of Damascus says, it was not possible for there to be any icon of God for no one has seen God at any time. But this has been changed by God's incarnation. Because the word has become flesh, God can now be represented. Not God the Father, but God the Son, who became man and reveals the Father's glory to us. And so, says John of Damascus, we can make an icon of the God who can be seen. Yet we must go further than this. If God can be represented, God the Son, that is, God made man, then he must be represented. This is a key point of the argument of the iconodules the defenders of the holy icons 
in their struggle against the iconoclasts during the 8th and 9th centuries. Not to make an icon of Christ is to suggest that somehow his flesh, his human body, is unreal, imaginary, a mere phantasm. Thus, the icon safeguards and guarantees our faith in the full reality of the incarnation. My second quotation is from the Divine Liturgy. The phrase used after the narrative of the institution of the Eucharist of the Last Supper and before the invocation of the Holy Spirit, the epiclesis, upon the holy gifts. The celebrant elevates the pattern and chalice saying, Thine own, from thine own, we offer unto thee in all things and for all things. To understand the deeper meaning of this phrase, let us ask ourselves, what is unique about the human animal? What it is it that makes us different from the other animals? Sometimes it is said that the human animal is an animal that laughs and weeps. That's very true. A sense of humor and a sense of tragedy are integral to our humanness. But I think we may go further than that. Often it's said that the human animal is distinctively an animal that thinks. At the outset of the modern era, the philosopher Descartes stated, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am. Yes, but in fact it's clear that the higher apes, when confronted by problems and difficulties, do something similar to our human thinking. Perhaps then thinking is not exclusively limited to us humans. And in any case, reason is only one among our faculties as human beings. We are not merely logical animals, we are much more than that. We have a power of intuitive vision, what the Greek fathers called the noose, that is far superior to ratiocination. Again, it's sometimes said that the human animal can be defined as an animal that uses tools, that acts as a craftsman, that builds, alters the environment. This is certainly true. Most of the animals merely live in the world, whereas we humans reshape and refashion the world. Once I was traveling back from France, and suddenly I realized that I hadn't bought a present for my parents to give to them on my return. So I rushed into a shop and saw a bottle with a squirrel depicted upon it. I like squirrels, and so I bought the bottle. It was, in fact, a liqueur made from nuts. As I continued on my journey, I reflected on the meaning of this bottle. Squirrels do indeed gather nuts. They bury them. They forget where they've put them. They quarrel with other squirrels over their secret store. This last is also a very human characteristic. But there's one thing that squirrels don't do, to the best of my knowledge. They don't make liqueurs out of nuts. <laughs> Only humans can do that. Actually, the liqueur was very nasty. <laughs> it would have been
have been much better to have eaten the nuts on their own in their original state. Yet it is not, in fact, entirely true to say that only humans alter the environment. After all, beavers build dams and bees construct honeycombs. Once again, we have not identified what is uniquely human. What about love? It's often said that the human animal is an animal capable of love after the image and likeness of God the Holy Trinity. Very true. But the animals also show love for one another and often live in community. Relationship is not a uniquely human quality. Indeed, some animals are more faithfully monogamous than many humans are, forming as they do lifelong attachments and showing grief when they lose their partner. So what is it that makes the human animal unique? To me, we come closest to the truth of the matter if we say that the human animal is an animal that offers, an animal capable of thanksgiving, not just a logical or a political animal, but a Eucharistic animal. Only the human animal, consciously and with full freedom, can act as priest of the creation, offering the world back to God. It's interesting sometimes to reflect, what do we do with our hands? Well, we can use our hand to point at people in an accusatory manner. Or we can clench our fist and shake it at people. But there are other more creative, more positive ways of using our hands. Instead of the clenched hand, we can have the open hand. We can open our hands to greet another person and embrace them. We can open our hands to offer. And I think this gesture of offering with open hands can be seen as a central, indeed distinctive, element in our human personhood. Now, this act of offering the world back to God, we perform supremely in the Eucharist exactly at the central point in the prayer of consecration when we say thine own of thine own we offer thee in all things and from all things but we are also exercising our royal priesthood our potentiality to offer to be eucharistic in many other ways the scientist through his research, is offering the world back to God. Even if he's an unbeliever. The craftsman is doing the same through his technological skills. But among the numerous manners of offering the world back to God, there is not least the making of icons. The iconographer takes wood and paint, material elements in which God's glory is already present, and then as a sub-creator after the image of God the Creator, he or she makes that glory manifest in a new way. In so doing, she or he offers the creation back to God in grateful and joyful Eucharist. 
Thus, icon making is one expression of our distinctive human privilege and vocation to act as priests of the creation. In this regard, the theology of the icon has profound implications for ecology. Finally, I come to my third quotation. Here I appeal to that great novelist and religious thinker, Theodor Dostoevsky. My favorite all-purpose anecdote is taken from Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov. It's a story that about an old woman and an onion. I'm sure many of you know it, but I shall tell it all the same. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a wicked old woman, and she died. And after death, she awoke, somewhat to her surprise, to find herself in a lake of fire. Looking out, she saw her guardian angel walking along the bank of the lake. She called out, there has been some mistake. I am a very respectable old lady. I shouldn't be here in this lake of fire. Oh, said the guardian angel, do you ever remember an occasion when you helped somebody else? She thought for a time, and then she said, yes, um, once a beggar came by while I was gardening, and I gave her an onion. Excellent, said the guardian angel. And reaching into his robes, he said, I have this very onion with me here. Let us see what it can do. So, she took the other end of the onion and he began to pull her out of the lake. I suppose perhaps it was not actually an onion but a shallot, but the <laughs> book says an onion. <laughs> now the old woman was not in fact the only person in the lake of fire. And when the others saw what was happening, they crowded round and hung on in the hope of being pulled out at once. This did not please the old woman. She began to kick, to cry aloud. Let go, she said, let go. It's not you who's being pulled out, it's me. It's not your onion, it's mine. And when she said, it's mine, the onion snapped in two, and she fell back into the lake of fire. And there, so I am told, she still is. <laughs> well, that's Dostoevsky's story. Um, and I can't think of a way of applying that to icons for the moment. <laughs> quotation from another of his novels, The Idiot. There, one of the characters uses the phrase, beauty will save the world. The icon precisely is a manifestation of divine beauty. The theology of the icon is not just a theology of presence, but it affirms and sums up in itself a theology of beauty. It expresses the saving power of beauty. What does this mean? Let's think of the triad found in Hellenic philosophy. The good, the true, and the beautiful. God is good. He is the source of all goodness. God is truth. He is the source of all things true. But God is also beautiful. And he is the source of all beauty. His beauty is filled with light and glory. How then does 
beauty differ from goodness and truth. In God, these three things coincide totally. And yet, each has its distinctive character. The first thing that strikes us about beauty is that it immediately attracts us. It moves our heart. It evokes our longing. It beckons to us, draws us to itself. Goodness and truth may inspire our admiration, but they do not necessarily charm and fascinate us in exactly the way that beauty does. Here it's important to think of an etymological connection. The Greek word for beautiful is kalos, and that is linked with the verb kalo, which means I call, I summon, I invite. That is the distinctive element in beauty. It calls out to us. It inspires within us an answering response. Now, the holy icons, by virtue of their spiritual beauty, do exactly that. They call out to us. They draw us to themselves. They awaken in us a joyfulness and an eager desire that brings us closer to God. In short, the holy icons express the attractiveness of God. Now, before I end, there's just one last thing that I would like to add. Though I am conscious that time is marching on. When I first began to lecture, I was always afraid that I would dry up and find I hadn't enough to say. And I was warned by the terrible experience of someone else who began to lecture in the university, and he gave his first lecture on just one day before I was to give mine. He prepared what he thought would last for an hour, but in his nervousness he read it so quickly that he finished it in 20 minutes. <laughs> Now, what he should have done was to start all over again. <laughs> because clearly people had not understood anything at all. But instead he looked up and said, I'm sorry, that's all I've got to say. And he rushed out. But in his confusion, instead of taking the doorway out of the lecture hall, he went and shut himself inside a broom cupboard. <laughs> In a humiliating way, he had to be let out by his audience. <laughs> and that's always stood before me as a terrible warning if you don't have enough to say. Actually, I've never yet dried up. <laughs> So I just want to add one last thing. The year of faith, which is being celebrated by the Catholic Church and we Orthodox can share in the aims of that year of faith, has as a central part of its purpose, I quote, the restoration of unity among all Christians. In his apostolic letter, Pope Benedict said it was his intention that the year should be, quote, a solemn ecumenical celebration in which all the baptized will reaffirm their faith in Christ. This is an aim that I, as an Orthodox, can wholeheartedly endorse. And in this quest for deeper unity of heart and mind, for greater visible unity, for unity in truth and love without compromise, the holy icon as a doorway into the kingdom 
has a vital part to play. Vertically, the icon, as a manifestation of divine beauty, expresses the attractiveness of God and draws us to him. But its attractive power is revealed not only vertically but horizontally. In drawing us closer to God, it also draws us closer to one another. The icon has a universal appeal, not only to Eastern Christians, but to believers throughout the world. Those who have no knowledge of orthodoxy or of church history will yet respond spontaneously to the message of the icon. Through our shared love of the holy icon, we can be powerfully assisted as divided Christians to overcome our separation. The holy icon can act as a strong and creative instrument for unity. Let me end with a prayer from the liturgy of St. Basil, which sums up exactly our search for unity. May the holy icon help to make this prayer a reality. Unite us all, one with another, in the communion of the one Holy Spirit. Thank you.